Hi everyone and welcome to this uh, webinar called Market Thursday. I will try as much as possible to do webinars on, on Thursdays the way I've been doing. Um, so we are September, not the 10th. So I should, uh, September the 10th, that was a week ago. Um, and today, uh, quickly, I just want to go through my, uh, my background. Uh, so for those of you who know me, uh, I started in 2000 as a cash equity trader in Paris. Then I moved to London working for a hedge fund from 2004 to 2008. Then from 2009 to 2018, I work as a property trader. Then since 2018, I'm managing my own money and helping retail traders through mentoring and through a video series. So what are we going to be covering today? Uh, today, we will be, as usual, looking at the situation across asset classes, stocks, uh, credit, commodities, and FX, uh, and doing a quick market review, trying to find what has been underperforming and outperforming, and looking at the next catalysts. Then we're going to be talking about briefly about yesterday's Fed meeting. Uh, we're going to be discussing as well the monthly oil market report and uh, the BIS uh, quarterly report. Then we're going to be moving into the quadruple witching day, which is tomorrow. And then we're going to do a quick Q&A session, depending on how much time we have. So today is literally um, looking uh, from macro, top down, looking as well at special situation, looking at active trading. So this is something that I try to cover as much as possible in the 4x4 video series and all the mentoring. Meaning that if you are running a portfolio either for a hedge fund or a prop trading, you need to have a combination of both a macro top down and understanding about what is making the, mar the markets moving and like the Fed, for instance, and as well be doing some active trading uh, slash special situation. So as last week, um, what I would like to do is, is looking across this uh, asset class classes performances. Uh, year to date and week to date. The reality is if you look at the yellow dots, which are the weekly moves, they had, there has not been that many moves uh, for uh, indexes and uh, for currencies as well. Uh, so we have been moving uh, week on week. So here you get the prices um, that were taken a, a couple of uh, hours ago, but more or less the indexes have been flat, um, which is a bit misleading because in between, uh, you have uh, probably a range of, if you look at the S&P of 3%, if you look at the NASDAQ, 5%. So the market is moving in a range that is, let's say, larger than usual, uh, 3 to 5%. And we'll try to, um, to explain one of the reasons uh, it is so. Um, if you look across asset classes, WTI has been doing very well. It's up 10%. It's back to the $41. Uh, but, you know, last week it was down. 15% to 20% when it went from 44 to 36, uh, roughly. Uh, so that is um, just coming back in the mid range uh, of this 40, 44. But um, again, stock indexes have been flat on the week. Uh, currencies have been um, not moving that much. So there is a bit of consolidation ongoing in the market. So now, let's now move uh, into the year to date sector performances, which are again very similar to what we had last week. If you look uh, on, the week to, on the week to date uh, for the sectors, actually, that is quite interesting because we know that the rotation started 10 days ago with uh, the, the winners, uh, meaning um, mostly uh, IT uh, that have been underperforming over the last 10 days. Uh, but more in, in, interestingly, you can see as well that industrials, materials, meaning the cyclicals have been massively outperforming the market. So again, the S&P, which is almost flat on the week, is massively distorted by the weight, the weighting of, of IT, meaning that when there is a rotation and uh, the sector that is rotating is that big, it is obviously uh, uh, massively uh, impacting the S&P 500, but underneath um, you can see that industrials, materials again, have been up uh, 4%. The energy is going hand in hand with the WTI, so that is no surprise to, to anyone. If we carry on 
across asset classes, if you look at the bonds, um, for instance, if you look at the US 10 years, um, there has been a lot of noise with the Fed, a lot of noise in the market. The US 10 years has been barely moving. Um, and the VIX, uh, uh, same, it's, it's not moving that much. It's in, I mean, it is between the 25 and 30s. Um, and if we look at the top winners versus the top losers, here you can maybe start to be generating ideas, but what you can see from the top winners is uh, we've seen this week many M&A deals, um, more importantly in, in, in biotech. So we had two big deals in, in biotech. Uh, GSX is another example that uh, there is some short squeeze and people um, going around uh, uh, with options um, and that is still affecting. Uh, is the sound better here? Uh, someone is, is telling me that the sound might be a bit uh, struggling. Can you confirm that uh, everything is fine now? Just a, a quick uh, confirmation. Okay, still good. So yes, a lot of M&A deals, um, uh, which is, which is uh, telling us that uh, there is money coming um, and there's, there is consolidation. Uh, and that tells you as well that if you put some short in the market, uh, as always, be careful and you need to have protection. Uh, protection, you can do that with options. Uh, and one of the ways of doing it is, you know, is buying out of the money calls, for instance, just to protect yourself if you're short, for instance. Um, so the catalyst that we're going to have for the next week, there are not that many. Uh, there is mainly the market flash PMIs that will be coming uh, around the 23rd. Uh, if we look at um, um, at the earnings front, we're going to have uh, Nike after the close on, on, on Tuesday, uh, Accenture on Thursday before the open, and as well Costco and uh, Micron after the close. So we have different sectors that are going to be impacted, uh, some ease, retails, uh, and, and um, another retail with Nike. Um, so as always, try from one week to another to see if there is any company that could impact uh, any sector or industry. I would like quickly, as always, to jump into the technical analysis price action, uh, starting with the S&P. Um, so as we can see, the S&P here is moving between the 33.20 and 34.30. So you have a range of 100 points, which is 3%. And that is quite, um, that is quite a big move, 3% that we have over the last seven to eight sessions. Um, uh, similarly, if you look at the NASDAQ, we have this massive, I mean, massive sell-off is a big word, but we have this correction at least. Uh, and since then, we have been consolidating between this uh, 10,900 and 1,160, which is a bit more than, than the 3%, which is 5 to 6% from the NASDAQ. Uh, so that is for stocks. I think what has been interesting as well, and that is pretty obvious because of the rotation that we had recently, um, um, growth has been underperforming value on a month basis. Um, still, if you look at the long-term picture since the start of 2020, uh, we had a massive outperformance of, um, of growth versus value. Um, so is it, is it the end of this outperformance? Only uh, time, time will tell, but at least um, you can see that on over these months, we had an underperformance of, of six to seven percent, at least, which is uh, something we haven't seen for for quite a long time. If you look at the Russell versus the S and P, uh, which is the big caps versus the the small and mid, um, the, the consolidation is still there. Um, carry on with with the stocks, XLK. This is the same story. Um, there are some names that I would like to discuss as well, which is uh, the transport versus the the, the Nasdaq. So actually, if you look at the transport, um, FedEx has been helpful uh, yesterday. But um, the overall sector or the industry, should I say, has been doing pretty well uh, over the last three months. If you, if you can hear, if you can look here, since May, it is not, it is performing as, as well as the NASDAQ, which tells you another sign that um, um, people are buying uh, cyclical, that uh, if you buy transport, that means you still believe in, in, in the US economy. On the other hand, we have Citigroup that, is, that uh, behaves uh, very badly this week. 
Um, I mean, it's a company specific and they had some issues about their control risk, the risk control. But um, uh, um, if you look at other names, uh, more uh, specifically in Europe with, um, I always mention the same, which, has, uh, which are Santander, for instance, or HSBC, uh, those names have been uh, really uh, struggling. But to come back to, uh, to, the, um, to what we just uh, discussed before, if we look at the XLB versus the SPY, for instance, which is the materials versus the, uh, the S&P 500, you can see um, how XLB, since the, 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 the start of, of, of the summer, has been outperforming the S&P and actually has been on a tier. Um, since uh, the start of September. So uh, XLB has been outperforming the S&P by 10% for this month. If you do the same for XLI, which stands for uh, industrial versus the S&P, same story here, which is, I mean, it's not as significant as the uh, XLB, but still that is coming into um, uh, one of the resistance that we had so far, or at least since March. If you look at the long-term picture, and I think um, this is something that you should all be doing, is for me, this is a good indicator of long-term cycle, XLI versus industrial, because that tells me about the economic cycle. Uh, still, you know, we got, we got a long way to go to come back into the 25, uh, but uh, on, on the short-term momentum, it has been, uh, doing doing fine. Um, let's go back into into this and uh, looking quickly at uh, um, gold. Uh, sorry, WTI first. So WTI again. We had the sell off. We are back to the level uh, that we had at um, in July. We are still consolidating. Um, OPEC was on the tape today. Not really convincing. Um, it is still a question of supply and demand with. China that cut uh, the demand by 1 million. The Saudis cut the supply as well, but um, the underlying is they, the market is not as strong as before. So we're gonna discuss that later during this presentation. If we look at the gold, uh, the gold is as well is consolidating uh, after the massive move. Um, so time will tell which way it's gonna go. Um, but that's uh, the actual consolidation. If we look at currencies, uh, your dollar, same here, we are trending between this 117 to this 120, consolidating since the start of August, so two months of, of, of consolidation. Um, the dollar overall has been weakening against many, many currencies. If you look versus the Chinese yuan, uh, that is really a tell that you know we are going back into the strong level that we have seen last time in 2019. Um, one currency that is making the headline because they are really struggling is the stockish lira. Today, uh, we broke the 750. Um, so that is obviously a, a weakening currency versus the dollar. You need to keep in mind that if you go short uh, the Turkish lira, there is the carry going against you. So when the carry is at um, annualized is probably 12, 15%. So every month you're gonna be losing 1%. But um, that's for the price action. Uh, anything else that I want to mention? Yes, uh, uh, th that is mainly about it. So let's go back into this presentation. So the catalyst, as I said, for the next 10 days, I think as well, there will be as always for the end of the quarter, the, the possible uh, quarter rebalancing. So that's something that we will be covering next week. I've been covering that during other webinars, uh, but that's a flow effect based on, on rebalancing of, your port of the portfolio of uh, big mutual funds. So let's go now into the Fed meeting. Um, so what happened yesterday was, as you all know, the Fed meeting and Powell making uh, the speech after uh, the Jackson Hole speech on the, at the end of August. And that is the new mandate uh, from the Fed. So the new mandate from the Fed is, again, uh, trying to give them more flexibility and not being stuck with the 2%, mainly with the 2% inflation. Um, so yesterday they discussed about maximum employment and inflation has risen to 2% and is on track to moderately exceed 2% for some time. So for some time, when you say for some time, you're more or less uh, said to people, you know, we're going to do whatever we want. 
uh, the market, you know, take, took it, it like um, not badly, but um, I think the market is always expecting more. Um, the conclusion of that is uh, we're going to have low rates for a, a prolonged period of time. We know that uh, if you look at the Fed fund rates, uh, if you look at the uh, euro dollar futures, um, nothing is going to happen for the next three to four years. Um, and if you listen to what um, Powell has been saying yesterday, is um, in terms of asset purchases and or QE, they are okay to adjust it uh, on the way down, on the way or the way up. Uh, but they seem to be less committed at the time being to be buying uh, more um, assets. Um, and I think what really they, they want to have is the Congress to be jumping uh, and helping them. If you look as well, uh, this is what the central bankers have been saying for years. If you look at Mario Draghi, uh, each time he was doing this conference on Thursday, he was saying, you know, ECB has been doing as much as possible. Now this is the time of uh, um, fiscal stimulus. Uh, there has been a lot of fiscal stimulus still. I think the Fed would be very keen on having more that, uh, uh, um, um, especially after um, the, the fact that in August we didn't have the rollover of this uh, 600 weekly dollars in the US. Um, so um, if we think about asset purchases, obviously the, the first impact is to be looking at uh, um, the, the Fed balance sheet. As you can see, this is a long-term chart here, uh, chart, and here we're going to have a short-term chart. Um, so we went from 3.5 trillion, 4 trillion, to now around 7 trillion for, uh, of assets owned by the Fed. Uh, but you can see that uh, since the beginning of June, uh, there has not been a huge increase of, uh, of the balance sheet. That can be explained a bit by the fact that the FX swaps have not been um, uh, rolled over. So mechanically, you have uh, uh, half a trillion that is not rolled over. So that is a bit misleading. Um, but still, uh, clearly the Fed is, is less keen on, on buying massively uh, assets. Um, but what they are telling us, looking at the, at the uh, euro dollar futures. So here you're gonna ha you have the euro dollar futures. So in, um, in uh, sorry, in blue, you get the euro dollar uh, that was in, uh, in January, 2020. And you can see now in, in, in orange, this is the euro dollar curve in September the 15th. So everything has been moving by 125 bips. Okay, so let's move up. So it's moving 125 bips. So the expectations are for the Fed uh, versus six months ago, that have been everything has been reduced for 125 bips. If you look across the curve, so from 2020, from December 2020 to June 2024, we expect the market is more or less expecting nothing uh, for the next four years, or at the end of these four years, a small 25 bips. Um, so. We're going to be lower for longer, maybe forever. Uh, I think the market will be testing in the near future um, the Fed. I mean, when I say testing, um, if the economy is not that great or if the market, you know, thinks that um, uh, the Fed has to be more active, uh, we will be seeing some activity and trying to force the hand of, of, the, uh, of the Fed to do something in terms of QE. Um, so that's, um, that's what could it's going to happen. Uh, quickly, that is something that I mentioned as well last week, but I want to go through it again. Um, so tomorrow we're going to have the quadruple reaching. Uh, I will explain that later. But most of the time coming hand in hand with the um, uh, this quadruple reaching, there is the index as rebalancing. So every three months, six months, 12 months, depending on, on, on the uh, different uh, stock indexes, they will decide which companies might go in or which companies might go out. So there is an announcement most of the time, 10 to 15 days before the entry and the exit. And you have, if you are working as a prop trader for hedge fund, you will have people dedicated to your, in your teams at forecasting the companies that will be entering. So for instance, there were a lot of talks that uh, Tesla will be entering the S&P 
and they didn't uh, match all the criteria. So you'll be buying before saying, okay, those three to five names will enter the index. And then there will be the time of the announcement between the time of the announcement and the time it will exit and on the day it will exit. So tomorrow, for instance, if you look at the S&P 500 at the close, will be effective the uh, um, going in uh, those three names, HC, TER and CTLT, and out will be HRB, COTI and KSS. So here we are talking special situation. Why I want to mention that, because my conviction is if you have the time, if you, um, if you've been managing money for quite a long time, those strategies work pretty well and, and you need to be ready. So that's something that I push pretty hard during the four by four video series, because that has been my conviction for years. So if you look at your stocks 50 to more, for instance, you get four names that are entering, four names that would be exiting, uh, and that's going to happen at the close. So if you have some time uh, tomorrow, look at those eight names between 4.30 and 4.35, which will be the time for the uh, European close. That might be extended because there's gonna be a lot of volume, but what you might have is uh, a funny moves on the close. And as I mentioned last week, um, one of the good names to be trading on, on days like this is days that uh, companies as well that have an ADR trading. So here we get BVA and we get Telefonica. Why? Because if Telefonica or BBVA are out, you can see a massive pressure, a selling pressure just on the close on the auction, meaning BBVA or Telefonica could be printing three or five percent on the close. And at the meantime, you could be hedging yourself with the ADR line immediately. So the, this is a risk-free trade as long as you do the FX. Um, but check all the names that are uh, doing index rebalancing. Let me quickly go in through the stock 600. So those are the names. Um, maybe check those names if you have those position and as well look at the close. If you look at, for instance, there are some Norwegian stocks that will be closing before uh, the European markets or continental European markets. Uh, and that is always interesting to be uh, trading and, and at least monitoring those names because out of these here 20 to 30 names, trust me, some are gonna be moving uh, funny to more. Same thing here with the FTSE because I know that um, there are many uh, UK viewers. Um, so those are the names, some of the names that will be impacted to more. Um, for instance, ITV will be leaving the FTSE 100 uh, and on the FTSE 250, sorry, there are many names that are entering and many other names that uh, will be exiting. So this is special situation. Um, but you know, you'd, you just need to have your, your list ready, making sure that you follow them. You, you, you look at how they are behaving on the day and more importantly, how they could be closing on the day, because that could be, you, uh, that could bring a huge opportunity. I remember, I think it was in 2015, um, I traded, um, I think it was ING. So ING printed down. 5% on the close um, and, and I did immediately uh, the, the, the trade uh, in the US. Uh, so that was um, um, after, you know, after cost and after, after the FX, you know, a trade of 3.5, 4% on, on the, you could do one to 2 million easy. Uh, so those are the trades. Um, again, if you are working for a prop trader or a prop trading shop, if you are working for a hedge fund, uh, that's the trades that you might be doing. Okay, so that's for special situation, active trading. Again, this is not for everyone. Uh, I don't want to be misleading people. Uh, you need to have the right setup, the right uh, uh, um, education as well to do that. So it's not, um, it's not for everyone. Um, let's now move at uh, something that is um, very uh, interesting as well, which is more macro top down. So every month you have the OPEC report. Um, so that's their monthly oil market report um, so that you can find, find here on www.opec.org. Um, and what I find interesting, this is quite a, 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 a large report, 30 pages something. But um, what I find interesting is they go through 
uh, a lot of macro. And um, for those of you and for anyone who is interested in macro, um, and that is quite good to have this uh, big picture. So they discussed obviously leading indicators. Um, so here I took the example of uh, how they are explaining the global purchasing managers in the indices, which is the PMI in August. So they will tell you and go through the different part of the world and telling us how the world is doing. I think that is always helpful. Um, you can do it on your own, obviously, but you can as well have the help of, you know, uh, people doing it as well and, and having those monthly reports, um, I find it pretty, pretty helpful. Um, on top of that, uh, if you look at those reports, more importantly, uh, obviously they want to discuss about the WTI, they want to discuss about oil market. So um, that was this week and if you look at the expectations and what happened, uh, this is something that we have been discussing massively on those weekly webinars is the uh, uh, supply and demand for WTI and how at one stage the uh, demand completely collapsed and actually took time for supply to adjust. So here looking at the world demand you can see in 2019 that is uh, the demand that we had. So again that is roughly that was roughly around 100, 100 million barrel per day. Um, and that was the same for the supply. At the end of 2020, we are expecting 90.6 million barrels. So more or less you have nine to 10% uh, demand shock uh, due to COVID, okay? So those are for the numbers. And now you need as well as an investor to think, okay, what's gonna happen next and what is the market pricing? OPEC is now saying, you know, from the 1963 that we had, that we have probably at the end of 2020, we're going to have at the end of 2021, 97.6. Okay, so that's up roughly 7% on the year. So down 10, up 7. But if you go up, if you go down 10 and you go up 7, and you compare this 99 versus the 97 from 2019 to 2021, obviously you're down two percent so the question as always and this is part of the struggle for for the oil demand is is it only because the world is slowing because of COVID, or is it more uh, a structural issue uh, meaning that electricity and ev and all those new technologies are taking uh, some market share from from the uh, old oil business model so that's something to that at the moment i'm not sure that um, um, people get uh, the perfect answer but as well what you can tell already and what you can you know already is um, the excelly the whole industry will be impacted so if you do uh, uh, expectations between 2021 and what we had in 2019 overall the sector has to go down uh, in terms of top line in terms of bottom line over those 24 months. So that's an OPEC, the OPEC report. Again, by definition, because this is OPEC, they are talking their own books. Uh, so they will lack the, the, the oil to go up. But for the macro analysis and as well for the supply and demand for the oil sector and WTI, I find those reports pretty helpful. Um, and I think you should have a look uh, at them. Um, similarly, uh, to those reports, um, there is the uh, BIS quarterly report. Uh, so BIS stands for Bank of International Settlements. Uh, so again, this is a quarterly report where uh, um, they explain and they go through different topics um, over the quarter. Um, so um, if we look at the, at the last report, um, they try, uh, uh, you should have a look as well, they, they were two interesting conversation. One was about the effect of low yields on uh, equity market. And the second one was on the effect uh, or the, uh, the behavior, the recent behavior of the US dollar. Um, so when they explained, uh, try to explain the effect of low yields on uh, the valuation of the equity market, um, they explained that uh, the fall of interest rates had a big impact on, on posit positively on the equity market and more importantly for the US market. 
Um, so that is explained a bit here. Again, I strongly advise you to have a look. This is extremely um, interesting between the short-term component and the long-term component, which is about saying because of the, um, um, the Fed fund rates and the lower for longer that we had before, obviously the discounted cash flow are using uh, 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 yields that are at zero now and meaning that everything, uh, not everything, but um, uh, the 125 bips that we had in favor uh, are coming down are massively help uh, stocks over the last uh, three months or since at least the Fed decided to do something at the end of March 2023. So again, have a look at it. This is pretty interesting. The second uh, topic was about uh, why the US dollar um, has been struggling. There has been a lot of talks about, you know, uh, is it the end of the US dollar as the reserve currency? Look, the dollar is still king on that uh, part. Uh, they are still making, you know, 80 to 90% of any trades in the world. Um, it is still uh, a king dollar. But what you can as well uh, say as a fact is the carry trade um, has been coming down. So uh, a, a currency carry trade means you are long the currency having uh, which has the higher yield and you short the one um, that is having the, 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 the lower yield. Why? Because you are benefiting and by being long um, the, the one uh, with higher yields. Uh, so if you look at the chart here, yeah, uh, so in green we have the US 10 years versus Japanese 10 years, in yellow that's the US versus the German, and in blue the US versus the UK. As you can see from the start of, of February 2020, uh, the carry has been coming down. So when the carry comes down, you can make sure, you can be sure that uh, the, the currency uh, will, be, will be weakening. Um, I, don't, I understand what uh, the, the bull dollars are saying, which is the carry is still well positive for, um, for the US dollar, but the trend has not been your friend. And that's something that is as well discussed in this BIS report that um, I found um, quite, um, I knew it, but still this is interesting. So here you can see uh, since 2019, how we have been coming down with the carry trade. Uh, that is a nice shoes actually. Um, so look at those topics, uh, both the OPEC uh, and, the, um, and the BIS. Uh, BIS, they have many, many good reports. Uh, trust me, they are smart people. So always, to, uh, always nice to learn and, and, and get educated from, from top players. Um, so now let me discuss um, the quadruple reaching day. Um, so um, when we say quadruple reaching day, that's, this is for the expiries for stocks index uh, futures, stock index options, stock options, single stock futures. In reality, we should be saying, you know, uh, the triple reaching and because the stock index futures that don't uh, sorry the stock the single stock futures is just like they don't trade um, so that happens every third friday of the month of march so which stands for h if you look at the futures june uh, m september which stands for the u in the future and december with the z um, so every third friday of those four months you have the expiry meaning that the contract for those four uh, products will be maturing on the day. Um, and what you're going to have in a day like tomorrow, you're going to see a big volume day uh, that actually, if you look at your chart very often, you'll see a massive uh, uh, day on those days uh, every year, uh, which is distorting uh, your chart. It is even more true for the last Friday, uh, for the last, sorry, uh, uh, expiry uh, which is coming in December because many people will be closing their position on that day and will be literally taking three weeks off before coming back on the second week of, of, of January. And, but what is, it, what is important is what you're going to have is on that day you get large open interest or bo of both speculative and edging position and that has been uh, as we've been saying exasperated by the fact that we had many uh, uh, weekly collapses, 
uh, and everything is distorted. So if you look at what happened in the market uh, over the last uh, five to 10 days, when we look at charts, when we look at technical analysis, uh, we've seen that the S&P is trading in a 3% range, that the NASDAQ is trading in a 5% range. Why? Because there is a lot of uh, uh, options position, a lot of uh, Greeks, a lot of gamma, and, um, and that makes those daily moves. Um, when you have a position like this one, you can do three things. Either you close the position, you roll the position, or you offset the position. And a day like, um, like tomorrow is going to be pretty interesting because the reality, if you look at the quadruple reaching, you need to know when is your underlying closing or expiring, should I should say. So if you look at the S&P, I said the, S the SPX, they expire on the third Friday the day before okay so that will be now and the settlement price is the opening prices of each of the index stocks so i don't know if you remember in june but i think it was trading i can't remember which handle it was but it went up like 30 to 40 points right before the open because there were many positions and just to push the settlement price so that's for the open then for the SPY options, which is the ETF, and for the stocks, they will be expiring at the close of business. So that means if you don't know when the underlying is expiring, you don't know what are the implications for the rolling of this position and as well for the possible Greeks to happen. So that is something as well that is another special situation, active trading that you do when you're a prop trader. In a day like tomorrow, you do the open, for instance, for the Swiss market. The expiry on the Swiss market happens on the open. So you will check tomorrow, if you wake up at 8 in the UK, you will check the volume that is done right on the open. That's the same in Italy. So there is a massive volume on the open. And actually, very often, there are some funny moves right on the open. Why? Because many people wait for the last minute not many, but some people might wait for the last minute to unwind the position, uh, Delta, for instance. And that means they will be forced to be buying or selling at any kind of price. So they will uh, um, affect the price massively. Similarly, if you look at the UK, at the auction from 1010 to 1015, that's the same. The, the index and many names in the index will be moving funny. What I like to be trading between 1050 and 11, is the euro stocks uh, 50. So if you take uh, uh, for 10 minutes those 50 names, you will find that I'm pretty sure, look at the market 1050 AM UK to 11 AM UK tomorrow morning, you'll see that there's gonna be a funny move from the index. Why? Because this is about the expiry. For the German uh, index, that will be at 12 PM, between 12 PM and 12.05. Uh, so that's the print on the Xetra auction um, and so on and so on. That's uh, from the CAC is from 240 to, uh, to, uh, to 3. Um, so you're going to have a lot of volume. You're going to have some possible funny moves. So if you look overall at all the indexes and then if you scroll down, you're going to find, you might find some, some names that are going to behave um, let's say in a funny way, okay? So what you're gonna be playing here is very often the, the reversion to the mean or some abnormal moves. Uh, but more importantly, if we look at the overall market, uh, there has been a lot of volatility. So the market has been going up massively based on, again, people buying weekly call options and, and pushing the market higher. So that has been uh, partly due to Robinhood traders or let's say retail traders and as well to professional like um, like this um, um, this Japanese firm, sorry, um, uh, pushing higher all these options. But now we are going into expiry. Expiry, you need SoftBank, sorry, thank you. Uh, so you need to uh, um, to reset or not the position. So what you see very often is Next week, um, if people uh, have not been rolling their position, they will have 
to hold those positions. And sometimes, most of the time when the market has been ticking up and up and up, as people need to buy new protection and the Delta going on, you'll see selling pressure. Bottom line is, I think the conditions that we had over the last week also has been mainly driven by this expiry. And from next week, we're gonna reset to a new market condition. So that's something to understand as well, that the market is more and more driven by options. If you don't understand the characteristics and, and the drivers of options, you don't need to be a genius. You don't need to do black and shoals in depth. You just need to understand Delta, Gamma, all the basics that tells you, you know, where to look for the expiry, where the open interest, uh, how is the market overall position in terms of Gamma, and when are the options expiring? Uh, for those, for some of you that might be still uh, uh, a bit of um, of um, unknown, but that is not that complicated. Um, it's just that, as always, you need and you want to understand the drivers of the market. Um, is, uh, so I got a question from Pieris. Is this the reason why is it, it is good to start rebalancing views and the portfolio after mid-September? Um, look, mid-September, I don't know. I think what you need to put in your calendar is more and more the expiry uh, of those contracts and, and options. So um, now we looked at it uh, last week. We look at the effect on uh, for Mondays, Wednesdays, and, and Fridays because of this weekly expiry. If you think about the quarterly expiry, they are extremely important. There is a lot of positioning. So try to look at how the market has been moving since the last biggest expiry, which was three months ago. The market has been moving massively up. Okay, so we went from, from 3,100 to 3,600, then we came back. So that means what? There is a lot of position from 3,100 to 3,600 that are still open. The aggregate position is gonna give you an overall gamma, an overall delta, but still there are many positions to close. To close. And this is even more true when we look at the different stocks. So when you have so many positions and you know that some of them will have to be closed before tomorrow, that gives you a lot of volatility. This is the, what we, we had over this week, this, this, this three uh, percent swing over a couple of days. Um, and you can see even in a day like today, we are up to 33.70, then we come back to 33.20, and then we squeeze on, on, kind of squeeze at the end of the session. But look at the open yes, uh, tomorrow. So the, let's say 30 minutes before the open on the US market, which is 2 p.m. UK, from 2 p.m. to 2.30, you can be sure that there's gonna be funny moves and you can, be, you can bet quite a lot that there's gonna be funny moves at the end of the session based on this expiry. And as well, if you look at the single names, we know that there are many names that uh, are gonna be affected by, by those rebalancing. And um, to me, this is kind of free money. If you're ready, if you know the names, if you, if you get the time, if you get the setup, you know, for me, this is always uh, those four days of the, of, of the year. Those are the, the days as a pop trader that really you can be making a lot of money and you don't need, really, you don't need to be smart. Um, so let me quickly explain what I do. Um, and, and this is what I try to explain through those different webinars is through the education that I offer. So I do both uh, an education through a video series, which is called the four by four and a mentoring program. So the mentoring program is an implementation of the four by four video series, but not only that could be as well for traders that have been struggling uh, with their strategies and are looking for help. Um, so the four by four video series is a very comprehensive online uh, video course that is based on my 20 years experience as portfolio manager and educator. Uh, and I try with those webinars to, uh, uh, to help you uh, building your, your, your process and as well um, to tell you what is behind all those webinars and how I've been working. So I launched this product in October, 2019, uh, that is based on the macro analysis and building more importantly, your infrastructure. 
uh, for trade uh, generation across asset classes and based on my experience and my background with a lot of focus on stocks. Um, so my ID generation, similar to what we've done today and what we have been doing for many webinars, is based on top-down, bottom-up special situation and active trading. That has been my conviction over the years that you need to be flexible and you need to have those different approaches. So you're gonna get 40 plus videos. Uh, that, is, that is mostly around 30 hours of footage and roughly 50 plus Excel spreadsheet. Um, so you can, if you want to obviously, <laughs> Uh, read the testimonials. Uh, if you have questions, uh, either for the 4 by 4 or the mentoring, I'm, I'm okay and happy to have a call with you and uh, on the Skype call uh, and explaining what I do uh, and where uh, there might be a match uh, between between us. Uh, for the mentoring, so the mentoring is is the um, the combination with the 4 by 4 video series, but there is no obligation. Okay. Um, it is a 12 weekly one-on-one -on -one sessions. This is done on Skype. Again, same as the four by four. And I've been saying that over and over. It's about building your infrastructure and learning how to trade your money in real time. So you will come with your real money. You will put uh, with a decent broker, probably interactive broker. And I will help you managing this money. So every week you will come with your watch list, watch list and I will help you managing this money. Um, so this is a there is back row again, top down, bottom up, active trading in special situation. And the whole idea is to be generating positive returns, uh, um, over time. Um, so this week I mentioned that at the start of this week, I finished a mentoring program, um, with one, uh, very nice person. Um, and it was up, I think 25% on the year. So, um, obviously the idea is not to tell people, you know, if you do the four by four, if you do the mentoring, you're going to do 25%. It's, it's for sure. The idea is if you follow the process, if you study hard, if you work hard, you're going to have some returns. Um, and that is something that was struggling, that was doing, that done another education, that had done another mentoring program and something worked for him. Okay. I am pretty convinced about the quality of the product. I'm pretty convinced as well that um, uh, it's not 100% uh, for sure. So uh, if, if, uh, if you're an educator and you tell people, you know, it's always gonna be working, you're just lying. Um, but I have this really, really strong conviction that both the four by four and the mentoring program are products that work really well. And, um, and that's going to help you either building your track record if you want to have access to the industry or more importantly uh, building your own uh, wealth um, um, for the future um, so this is it for today uh, what about we do uh, 10 minutes of q a sessions if you have questions um, What's your view on the euro dollar? Um, so that's from David. Um, so let's look at the chart of the of the euro dollar. Can you can you see? Yeah, you can still. I mean, I'm. Let me. So that's that's. I mean, I'm pretty sure that most of you get the same chart. But um, let me give you this chart. So if you look, let's do a weekly. That way we don't have. So if I look at this. That is what the chart is telling you. Okay, so is it bull the dollar? Not really. Is it bullish the euro? Yes. I know as well that, uh, and we know that the Fed is going to stay lower for longer. And we get the feel that actually they're going to stay lower for longer than, than, than what they could or should do. So you get uh, uh, the character that is not helpful. I think you like it or you don't like it, but me, looking from Europe, it feels like socially and, and politically uh, US as, is struggling. And um, I'm not arguing that Europe is doing much, much better. Um, as a French, as a British, I know that uh, Europe has been struggling. So that is not the point, but you need to do, when you do Euro dollar, when you do FX, you do both absolute and relative. And in terms of relative, 
uh, you can argue that the uh, uh, um, U.S. have been um, at least struggling over the last couple of years, and, and that's uh, uh, not on everything, and not everything is 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 black or white. But that's you know I I believe as well in the price action. I believe in 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 the chart that I have in front of me, um, and and so your dollar, um, I'm not that bullish the dollar. Let's put it that way. Um, what else do we have? Can you, so from, from Torsten, can you recommend the daily routine for trading? Um, let me put that in front of me. Uh, a daily routine. Yes, I mean, daily routine, I mean, um, the job, I mean, when you're a trader, you always get this routine. So if you take the example, if you are living in, if you are living in London, if you are in the UK, so, the market opens in the UK at eight o'clock. So you wake up at, let's say, 6, 6.30. You are at the office between 7 and 7.30. If you go earlier, that's where, because you are working in a bank and actually you're not a trader, you're just, you know, making calls. But as a prop, you're coming to the office 7, 7.30. Hedge fund, same. So you'd be, you try to be reading research, um, making, um, understanding the same as the catalyst that we look at today, trying to know what's gonna happen, during the day so that can be macro that can be company so you make you're gonna have your watch list based on what might happen on the day so you're gonna have your five ten single names you're gonna have your macro you're gonna have your alerts so this is in a sense what you expect to be happening then you get the unexpected and the unexpected happens you know with twitter happens with news with you know anything and that happens if you trade the european market eight to 4.30, 4.30, but you know that from 2.30 to 4.30, what is driving the European market will be the US market. So you'll be looking at the US market, this is your routine, and you'll be looking at what is driving the market. So these days uh, has been, you know, the, the leaders and the leaders have been turning. So the routine is you need to do always the same thing and being making ready to for the unexpected. Um, what works well for me is to have to build many uh, filters. Okay, so if you think about the four by four video series, if you think about the hedge fund, if you think about uh, you, what you want to have is to diversify your portfolio and to diversify the quality of your filters. Okay, so you're going to have sometimes maybe uh, you're going to be able to uh, uh, to be um, uh, managing your money on an intraday basis almost. So you'll be, because because of COVID, you're working from home and say, look, I'm not gonna be doing my job as an engineer. I'm gonna be looking, doing my passion for the next two weeks trading the market. Okay, so you decide tomorrow morning, you're gonna be doing index rebalancing. You're gonna be doing um, um, options. You do that on the day, but you still need to have some filtering and you're gonna have some filtering next week on, the flash PMI, or you're gonna have another filters. So the routine is having many filters that you look every day. So every day you come, you wake up, and you look at all the asset classes. So you want to know how the, uh, obviously you look the first thing when you're an equity trader, you look at where is the S&P future. You look at the S&P future, you look at where our Asia, Asia has been doing, you look at the different currencies, you'll be looking at bonds. If they are moving, you'll be looking at commodities. And then you'll be looking at the different sectors and industries and, and filters and filters. Okay. Uh, uh, question from Balder on the Euro stocks uh, rebalancing. Um, yes, I mean, uh, the rebalancing is um, what you're trying to, to, we are not talking about the 10 to 15% trade. We are talking of a trade between one to 5% or maybe 10% sometimes, where there's going to be an abnormal move on, on, the, uh, on the close. So I can't remember, uh, imagine that um, uh, BBVA tomorrow, um, because it's exceeding the uh, Euro stocks 50, most of the European fund managers will have to sell their exposure of BBVA. So what they're going to do, is they're gonna say, no, I'm not gonna take the risk. I'm gonna wait the last minute to do it. So at four, at 4.30, 4 
they're going to call their or 429. They're going to call their brokers and say, look, I have X millions of BBVA to sell. So BBVA, so if we look at BBVA, BBVA. Okay, so that's BBVA. As I said, you know, the chart is awful. It's, it's, it's like HSBC. But imagine that, you know, uh, because of the selling pressure, it is printing 230, okay? So the last at, uh, at uh, 429.58 is 241. And there is an imbalance because too many sellers and it prints, you know, down, uh, let's say, 5%, which gives you 225. You know that the selling pressure is mostly because of this rebalancing. So either you do, you buying the stock at 225 on Madrid uh, 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 market exchange, and you're selling immediately the BBVA idea, or you say, because I can't do the, the both, I'm hoping normally that there's going to be some reversion to the mean. Okay. And that will be, again, it's not a long-term trade. This is really pure trading uh, based on 20 to 30 names. Maybe nothing is going to happen. Um, but if you're not ready, if you, the worst thing for me when I was sitting in a trading room is when I didn't see those trades and suddenly I was hearing those guys sitting next to me and say, Oh, have you seen what happened on the close on bang, bang, bang. And you knew that those, those guys were making, you know, two to 5%. And because the, the, there's going to be a lot of volume, you're going to be able to do a lot, a big size. So uh, as a pop trader, this is, this is paradise um, because you know that the size is going to be, is going to be around. Um, how long would you take, would you take on average, would you to generate bottom up stock IDs? Uh, I think for the bottom, bottom up uh, stock IDs, Pieris, um, it, it's mainly um, the drivers are going to be changing. Okay. When I do bottom up, I be looking at, at um, different ID generation. So sometimes I'll be looking, let's say, at the dividend yield. Sometimes I'll be looking at the free cash flow. Sometimes I, so the ID generation is going to be different from one moment to another. Um, again, to me, what is, what is key and hopefully what I try to achieve with my mentees is, is, is to make sure that they know to do it. And, and you know, we, we, I could do a mentoring program where for three months we do exactly the same sectors. We do three sectors and we're going to do well. Okay, maybe. And then after those three months, the market's conditions completely change. So I have so many stories of people that have done mentoring programs, they are, you know, 20%. And on the day they stop the mentoring program, they lose 50% because they have no idea how to build their portfolio uh, through different uh, um, uh, asset classes or through different sectors or industries. I mean, this is really, if, if you want to be making money for one to two months, it's possible you can go big in one thing, but in the long run, this is much harder. And, and I think that goes back to the idea of, or what's the routine of the discipline of a trader or portfolio manager, you need to have those rules and, 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 and stick, uh, stick to them. Um, what else do we have? Last one, then um, hopefully, what else? Uh, I think this is it. Um, yes, yes, I think this is it. Okay, uh, so thank you everyone. Um, what I suggest for you to do if you want to obviously is you can subscribe on the website to uh, um, the future webinars. Um, I'm gonna do another one next Thursday, same time. I'll try to do as many as possible um, as long as people are nice and, <laughs> and, and like it. I'm, I'm, I'm okay to do it. I enjoy doing it. Uh, so uh, next week, if you have, um, um, I think it works well as well if it goes um, back and forth. So if you have questions on one topic that you might be struggling uh, with, that could be a good idea for you to send uh, that to me. There is no stupid questions. Then maybe I can uh, uh, elaborate on that topic next week. Uh, recently, I've done this, this uh, options uh, video on, on, on bid offer. Uh, that was coming from, from a question from one of my ex-mentees. 
uh, there is no stupid questions and, and, uh, and I think it might help you. And as well, it might help you from the content that I might offer because it's hard for me to always make people happy between, you know, the starters and people that are more advanced. Um, so uh, thank you everyone. Uh, and uh, again, uh, hope to see you soon. All the best everyone and good night. Bye-bye.